please. The two of you. Uh, to the professor of the U.S. College. Okay. Uh, could you take your argument further and um, the one that you mentioned on, on the property and, and apply that? Would that apply also to plants? You know, I, um, I thought this may be the first time I've ever talked about this and got out without somebody asking me about plants. Um, but I was wrong. No, it, it's a fair question. Uh, plants uh, are alive. They're not sentient. There is no evidence whatsoever to suggest that animals have any, or that plants have any sort of minds that prefer, want, or desire anything. They're alive. They have all sorts of reactions that they have evolved to. But why, I mean, think about it for a second. Why would plants develop sentience? It would be vestigial. It, they, they wouldn't be able to do anything about it. They're sort of rooted and they can't move. And so it, it would seem to me that um, uh, this idea that, well, would I apply it to plants? Plants aren't sentient. They have no interests. If they have no interests, nothing we do can adversely affect them because they have no interest to, uh, to adversely affect. I might have obligations that concern plants. I might have obligations not to overeat plants because I have obligations to other humans to not eat more than I need, but I, don't have a, I can't have an obligation to a plant any more than I can have an obligation to the glass. I can have an obligation that concerns the glass. I ought not to throw it at somebody. I don't have an obligation that I can owe to the glass because the glass doesn't have any interests for me to adversely affect. Thank you, Gary. There was a second question here before, and then it's you. Um, these arguments range from ethical things which I would, and moral things which would seem to play out in regulatory environments to um, some arguments that this is um, an economic exploitation. And I guess I'm just wondering whether in the future um, you think the regulatory side, which is uh, imposing your own morals and ethics on other folks through, through regulation and laws, or the markets will decide where this, uh, this all ends up. Who, who are you asking that to? I don't know. Um, um, I don't think, even though um, I'm also trained as a lawyer, I also I don't think that the law is going to, I mean, the, this is not going to work by imposing it on people. Um, this is a, a, a behavior that most of the world engages in. The only way this is going to work is by a paradigm shift what I might call a revolution of the heart, as it were, so that we start seeing that this is, this is wrong. It's a wrong thing to do. Um, and and um, so I don't think, right, I mean, governments are not going to be in the lead here. Um, and the law is really not something which, the law generally does not lead anything. It follows. Um, and, and so um, I'm not in favor of, I certainly wouldn't propose that we have a law that tells people that they can't eat meat or dairy or eggs. I think that would be dumb. Um, but I think that once, you know, once we get a substantial number of, of ethical vegans, then certain sorts of regulation that would be far more meaningful, certain things that prohibited certain things might be possible as a, as a legal and legislative matter. But I, I don't see the law. That's why I started by saying it's a pre-legal moral right not to be property. It's got to be something that we see. I would like to think we wouldn't have slavery um, even if it were not um, a legal norm, which it is. Um, uh, it's actually one of the few norms in internet, customary international law, one of the very few norms of customary international law is against slavery. And I would like to think we wouldn't have slavery, or most of us would not think, well, you know, what the hell, slavery's great um, if it weren't, if it weren't, you know, uh, uh, if it became legal, I mean. Uh, uh. Something on the same lines. I just um, want to highlight the importance of the question, first of all, because to be aware of who's making this, the decisions is already a step forward. So we need, as individuals, to be clear on how our decisions are being made, our own and our societies. And I think it's very true that some major decisions are being taken by, in terms of economic units and very shallow utilitarian principles, especially um, since 
much is being governed by uh, multinational companies. This, of course, is not up to standard, and I make an appeal for every individual to be aware of our own, each, um, each of us, responsibility in guaranteeing that the principles that are responsible or are important for our decisions are not simply uh, maximizing profit or egocentrical achievement, but they should be considering either communal or uh, factors that contribute to the well-being of the entire creation, including animals. Let me just add another little point about the previous question. I think it was a very important, significant point. And I would add something to what uh, Gary mentioned. Uh, certainly, the point of the question was to make us aware of the hierarchy of beings, because plants are not sentient to a certain degree. You know, plants which react to the light of the sun and so on, as you know. So the issue is much more complex. We don't seem to be able to draw a very clear line between, let's say, animals or uh, living things that do not deserve uh, a certain concern and living things that do. Where are we going to draw the line? What about insects? There is a section here which is working on insects and the future production of insects. So uh, the issue is a complex one, and sentience of within the living, uh, within the biosphere, is one of the issues. Just to highlight, therefore, that this question is an important question, and we need to take it into consideration as, as regards our relation to uh, non-human animals and non-human living things, the entire spectrum. You're next, yes. Okay, thanks. Um, uh, Laura Boyle uh, from Chagask. Um, Gary, I really enjoyed your talk and was very brave and stimulating and thank you. I think a discussion point that comes out for me from it is as an animal welfare scientist and you, were, you spoke a lot about animal welfare and I do feel a growing unease in my capacity as an animal welfare scientist given the scale of the problems that are out there for farm animals. And I mean, throughout this meeting, we're talking about prevalences of different lesions and different production diseases. And, you know, they don't seem to be, they're not going away in spite of all the years of research we've done in this area. So I, I you know, what, a lot of what you said resonated with me in terms of this unease about what we're doing, given that the problems aren't going away. But I, so that's kind of a general discussion point. But the other thing I'd be interested in your opinion on is uh, a documentary I saw recently on the Faroe Islands where the the people are under increasing pressure to stop whaling, you know, by society and Pamela Anderson was over there and, you know, giving out to them. Um, and in fact, it seems they'll have to stop because of the heavy metals in the whales. But they were arguing they can't produce, you know, they don't have agricultural land. And I suppose it could apply to sub-Saharan Africa and things where small amounts of animal protein in the diet make such a huge contribution to their health. You know, it, it, for me, it's kind of harder to yeah, I'd be interested in your opinion on that because the Faroese were saying, will we import grains and fruit and veg from all over the world to our island if, if we stop eating the puffins and whales? So I'd be just interested in your opinion on that. Thank you. It's for you, Gary, I guess. Well, you, you know, um, there, there are lots of um, things that your question raises. Um, there's a whole issue about um, the distribution of resources and about justice as a general matter and about um, the fact that, you know, you can say that in a lot of places where people d don't have um, a lot of plant food to eat, the, the plant food that's grown there is grown for feeding to animals that are exported and things like that. There are all sorts of problems in, in, in that way. Um, but um, my view is that, um, you know, it's sort of similar to, there was an argument made a few years ago uh, with respect to some other island situation, and I don't remember what it was, but they were arguing, there was a question about, um, there was incest going on, and they were arguing that, well, we couldn't sustain our population without incest. I don't know if you remember that, that, that um, uh, you can Google it, I'm sure you'll find it. Uh, and and um, it doesn't, the, uh, that doesn't answer the, the, the moral question. Um, the fact that there may be, you know, however, however, 
even if you don't take a rights position and you just take a welfare position, you could say, well, there are going to be some situations in which there's going to be a real clash, and it's a real clash that we can't we can't address. It's a lifeboat situation, you know, where you, you've got a you've got a situation where you've got to make a choice, and whatever choice you make is going to be an unsatisfactory choice. Um, but that doesn't account for, for example, it doesn't affect anybody in this room in terms of what they're going to eat um, and and the choices they're going to make. Um, and so, you know, the fact that there might be some situations where there are real clashes, um, I could see I don't take a welfareist position, I take a rights position, but if I took the position that it's wrong to inflict suffering in any situation in which there's not a compulsion, I would be willing to sort of think about situations in which there are potential compulsions and, and say, well, you know, maybe that's okay in that situation, but it still rules out you know, the, the vast majority of, of, of what we're doing. You see what I'm saying? Yeah, no, I, I, I get you. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, Laura. There was a question there. Uh, yes, uh, thank you for this discussion. Uh, just a short comment. Uh, plants are communicating and they can exhibit competitive growth uh, affected by their genetic relationship. So I think the story about plants is not finished. But then my question is about responsibility, because uh, a lot of colleagues, we are already aware of all what was said this morning, and generally the message is that the more efficient we are in techniques, the more responsible we must be. So it can be at the level of individual researcher, but for the animal farming system, my question to you or maybe to someone else in the audience, animal farming system is a chain of actors so uh, who, is, um, who has the responsibility if different actors are not connected? How could we ha organize uh, a shared responsibility so that the farming system holds? Because you may have understood that I consider that we will still have animal farming system in the future. But I think we need to be more responsible than just complying with the rule. Because then it is... Uh, you have a written uh, rule, and so I am okay because I am complying with the rule. No, th this is not th the best way, in my opinion, but responsibility in a complex system, how can we organize it so that it is shared and that each one, each actor contributes to the responsibility of, of the whole? Who wants to answer the question? Louise? So I just react to this very interesting observation that we all live in a very uh, rich and complex network of relationships. We, and no one is an island, as you know, so um, whatever we do, we have rules that guide us, we have a space for decision making which is individual, and we also have perhaps a space where we can contribute to decisions at a, at a, a broader level. And I think it's very important for us to be committed first as individuals, each one of us can think in the silence of our hearts where we stand on these issues and where we want to go and then, of course, explore the space available to achieve that desire. And I hope that through um, these very general reflections that we have presented during this um, uh, plenary session, it may help you make up your minds about your desires, where you see a, a, a better future for the planet, and then, of course, explore the possibility of, well, convincing your department or your, your boss about making changes in the right direction. I'm not convinced that, you know, the world will change for the better immediately tomorrow morning, but certainly, as regards individuals' hands-on experience in this area, you have a special role to play in forming opinion and changing it uh, to the better. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Uh, let me make a remark on a remark that was made earlier about, about the law. Uh, you said we need no law, there is uh, no rule there, and everybody is responsible for his own mind. But when you talk about animal welfare, you see a lot of emotions. You see emotions coming in, uh, in, in places where you don't need them. Uh, uh, there are uh, welfare groups who are going very far in uh, uh, doing with the emotions what they want to. So 
I state that you need a, 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 a regular mainframe. You need some rules that you can apply to the society to make things happen as you planned it to happen, that everybody can speak out about the values they have. But do you agree with me that no law is wrong, that you need a regulatory framework in the society to make all these values go in place where they want to have and they can talk about the things they want to talk. Uh, Ber Bernice has talked about a lot of these values, but you have to regulate it. No law for me is wrong. Thank you very much. Who wants to answer? But Yes, no law, no law would not work at all. And the best example is what happened in the EU, where you still are stuck, you could say, with definitions of genetically modified organisms from 20, 30 years ago. And where new, you could say, all kinds of new developments are more or less uh, on hold now, because uh, there is no possibility to discuss uh, in law uh, a new opening of, say, a definition. It needs first to go to politics and a lot of discussions be before the law can change. And um, of course, uh, you could think that uh, CRISPR-Cas, for example, doesn't, use, doesn't has to use, say, foreign DNA, can also just silence a gene or uh, change it a little bit, but uh, it's not really, you could say, an old school genetic modification. So there are now many differences, but they are not, you could say, you cannot read it back into the law. So scientists, I think, have a, have a real role to play here because people in law and also the public has ideas, scientific ideas, from outdated 30, 40 years ago. So they are not on the brink of new science. And they need, you could say, uh, people to communicate also the new ways of seeing what the, what the genome is and other uh, definitions of uh, these new technologies. Because if not, you can go on with your science, but uh, people will not, uh, in the law, for example, not allow it. And, um, so that's, I think, an important message is that, uh, yeah, go do some work with, uh, in this case, uh, lawyers and, and not only uh, say that it will uh, be damaging. That's, of course, true, but you have to work. Thank you very much, but the next question is coming from the left side, from your right side. First of all, I want to thank you so much, all the speakers. My question is from the dear professor from USA. Regarding the approach of being a vegan. The, the what, I'm sorry? Approach of being vegan. My question is, so we know that the cows are not designed to eat grain. So we change them for more intensive production. So we need more energy. We feed them with the grain. So this is not their natural. So we changed them, and now we reach to the point during a long time, we reach to the point that uh, what we are doing is not right, and now we want to fix it. My question is, is it like a TV with the switch on and off, to just turn it off, and because if just we release all the cows, they live normally about 20 years. Each year they give one or two calves, and we let them to do that. So what will be the future? How it will look like? From other side, we have lots of rice production. And there's not so much talk about how much methane is produced from rice fields. One third of the fresh water used for the plants is used for the rice. And these are not the topics. So my question is how we can look to the future if we want to fix the problem. Is it just turn it off? Thank you. I'm not sure what you mean by t turn it off. Um, I would say this. If we wo all woke up tomorrow morning and we were all vegan, we all said, wow, this is, you know, we, sh we, have, we, we, we shouldn't be doing this. Uh, we would obviously be very different beings. Um, and we would, um, you know, we would then have to figure out what we do with the animals now in existence. 
what the way I see it, and, and I, you know, my view is we need to educate people. I don't think this is going to happen through laws. I don't think it's going to happen through regulation. I certainly don't think it's going to happen through violence. Um, I think what we need to do is just educate people. As demand goes down, there will be fewer animals brought into existence. Uh, it, you know, it's a supply and demand thing, right? And as the demand goes down, the supply will, will go down as well. Um, we can't turn off the switch and let them all go. I mean, that's, that's what domestication is about. What we've done is bring into existence animals who are perpetually dependent on us and that are basically servile to us, and we want them to be that way. And so we can't just sort of, you know, I can't open my door and let my dogs run free. They're not going to become wolves. They're going to get run over by cars, and they're going to starve. So they're domesticated animals. But the idea is as the demand goes down, um, the, the supply will go down. As far as water is concerned, um, we, all, we ought to be always discussing about the inefficient use of resources, but I honestly don't believe that um, the evidence is quite clear. The amount of water, the, the problems with soil erosion, the amount of plant, I mean, we talk about plants. Well, you know what? Even if plants are sentient, we're still obligated to be vegans because if we're producing, if we're using six to 12 pounds or three to three to 12 to 16 pounds of plants to produce one pound of flesh, then if plants are sentient, we're better off eating them directly rather than eating 12 pounds of them when we have a steak. Um, but I think we ought to be, I think we ought to be um, concerned about any efficient, inefficient uh, resource use. But I don't think there is anybody who would deny that animal agriculture involves a tremendously inefficient use of resources in terms of water, in terms of everything else, grain and everything else. Thank you very much. We have one more question here, and then we are slowly running out of time. Thank you very much. Uh, indeed, I have a, <clears throat> rather another uh, uh, quite a fundamental question indeed is if we do not allow progress anymore uh, through new technologies, uh, and whether is that in, in animal breeding or even plant science, uh, from a physio <laughs> Uh, philosophical point of view then are we going to where are we going to put uh, the limit on domestication are we going to reverse domestication because uh, eventually that could be a consequence I can tell you there's a, a professor he died away uh, from UN, uh, Kent University here the consequence of, uh, of some issues is that we have to decrease uh, decrease the world population. He had some ideas about how that, uh, or there were ways to do it. He made not himself popular, I can tell you. Did you could you understand the question? Was it to me? <laughs> <laughs> Let's answer, Sorry please. for that. Okay. It, it's, it's, it's quite a general question indeed. Where do, where do we put the limit on domestication? Are yeah. we going to reverse the domestication to some extent? And that, I think, indeed, is, is in the first place a, a question for the new uh, committee. Uh, yes, and that's the other thing. EAAP stands for European. Uh, indeed, in, in a number of questions already have been raised, Europe uh, tends to have uh, quite specific views on uh, some issues. Uh, are we going to expand them, indeed, to the world and, and try to put them forward as a world standard also? So, so these are many different questions. Um, you started off saying, are we going to halt progress, scientific progress for philosophical reasons? And then I have a question to you. What do you consider scientific progress? I mean, progress can mean a lot of different things. Uh, progress could also mean to uh, build, build farms like the, the Kipster farm that I showed, where animals' agency and animals' interests are taken into account a lot more, for example. Um, and then, and then you said, well, will it mean in the end that we have to curb human population growth, I think? And I agree fully with that. And of course, there are many different ways in which you could do that. Uh, but I think that ultimately the implication of, of a lot of the arguments that we've been hearing now is that we will need to curb human population growth. And I think that is something that people are, don't really dare to say because of the horrific examples that we've had in the past of ways to go about it. Yeah, like a forced sterilization, one-child policy. Uh, but that doesn't necessarily have to be the way. I mean, uh, there's lots of research that shows that just um, educating women, giving women higher status in, in a lot of countries automatically leads to uh, a decrease in, uh, in population growth. 
Um, now, I can't recall what your last question was, because that seemed to be different. Back. Sorry? Domestication. Of oh, domestication. Back. Yeah, well, that's a difficult one because um, I'm not sure that I completely agree with my with my colleague about domestication. I think, um, you know, it's something that has happened, and um, I don't think it should necessarily be phased out. I think uh, these animals are here now uh, among us, and they have their own interests and their own good life to live as well. So we have to think about well, how can we ensure that they have the possibilities to to live a good life. Well, that will probably mean not having so many of them because we won't, well, I agree with, with Professor Fen showing that we don't need to have all these animals uh, uh, for, for our food, but it doesn't mean that you necessarily have to phase out uh, these animals. If, if beings have come about in a morally problematic way, it doesn't mean necessarily that you should let those beings go extinct. I mean, to, to I think, borrow your own analogy of, of slavery, you know, slavery has, has led to a uh, population of African Americans in the US, and that was definitely a morally wrong thing to do, but that doesn't mean that people who are a result of slavery should be phased out now, right? And I, th I feel the same way about animals who are domesticated. They should not necessarily be phased out. We should just think about, well, these new types of animals, how should they uh, be treated right? But, but slavery just involved, you had human beings that had the legal, they had a legal disability. Mm -hmm. When they were emancipated, then that legal disability is removed. Mm -hmm. And what you have are humans who no longer have a legal mm -hmm. disability. If, if you were to say tomorrow that, well, these animals no longer have the status of property, you have domesticated animals that are bred to be perpetually dependent and servile. Mm -hmm. So it's not that you can, you know, that they just go on with their lives because their lives are lives that we've basically engineered mm -hmm. and created. So, you know, I, I, and I don't know that I would say extinct because these are not species that naturally occurred. These are beings that we, we created through domestication. Um, but, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a complicated question. I don't think that ultimately domestication can be morally justified, but that's a, a, another issue. Just, just one, um, one response. I, I don't think that dependency is necessarily morally problematic. If you look at it from a care ethical perspective, I think we all, have, we all stand in relationships of dependency to others, and that not, that's not the problem as such. I do agree with you that having property uh, is problematic, but that in the end is a legal notion, um, you know, and I think there is a difference between a legal notion of property and a moral notion of property. In fact, if you have you know, legal property over an animal, this also means that you have to look after its welfare. And it mm. does also bring with it certain obligations. Uh, so I think it's, you know, better than to think, well, we should just turn back the clock or phase out uh, domesticated animals. We should think about, well, how can we actually treat them in such a way that they can live the good life? Yeah? What is a good life for them? And if that means dependency, then we have to think about how can we create dependency without necessarily being dominant over these animals? I, I, would, I would say this to you that um, I've just finished writing an article about dependence. And um, I think, yes, we are dependent on each other. But I would say that the dependence of, of domesticated animals on us is qualitatively different from the sorts of dependence that we have on each other. Uh, and and um, so I would say that that was, that that was different. Um, but in any event, Thank you very much. I faced a problem. I could listen to you for longer, <laughs> but we are out of time, unfortunately. So, unfortunately, we are out of time, and it is time to thank you very much for being here, sharing your thoughts with us. I, 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 just, I just want to say one thing, and that is, I really appreciate, I mean, I understand, we are like, you know, I understand that most of you were probably cringing when I was speaking, and I understand that. It's your business. It's if, as I was saying to somebody before, if you came and said, you know, all law schools ought to be closed because lawyers are like vermin and they should be, you know, I would be defensive and I would be upset. So I just want to tell you, I think you've been really wonderful and listened, and I really enjoyed, uh, and I've had a number of discussions with you, and it's been really great, and I've, I've really, Thank you for inviting so did me. We. Thank you very much, Gary. Also to the other speakers. <laughs>